Chapter 1 Clyde Bellman climbed the stairs at the end of his long day mending fences for his bison herd, and his back ached. He knew bison ranching was an odd profession, but with bison being the only cattle indigenous to North America, he felt like they should be the main meat eaten there. Besides, they were going to be extinct before too long if the railroad kept killing them off. He went into his bedroom, peering out the window of the house he'd built five years before. It had four bedrooms, and he even had a bathroom with indoor plumbing on the first floor. It was built for a queen, but he had no lady to share it with him. He'd once thought he'd marry Miss Marjorie Dalrymple from Mistletoe, Montana, but Marjorie had long since moved on to greener pastures. He'd wanted to wait until 1891 to marry, because he had a plan, a good strong financial plan that didn't account for marrying before then. He was in the exact financial position he'd wanted to be in, a few months ahead of schedule, and now he was ready. Ready to take on the family life. He'd heard tell in town of some of the men sending off for mail-order brides, and he'd even seen an ad in the paper, looking for gentlemen worthy of a good bride. He'd sent for one. He stifled a yawn. It was after nine, and he had a lot more fences to be mended the next day. He'd ride into town on Saturday and send a letter off to the matchmaker. Surely there'd be some bride who wanted to move to Mistletoe and marry him. Asterisk. Mary Winter smiled at Miss Elizabeth Miller, who held the door for her as she entered the post office. Thank you, Elizabeth. I swear the orders start getting crazy around the end of October. I never know how I'm going to keep up. Elizabeth smiled sweetly. You make the most darling Christmas ornaments anyone has ever seen, Mary. That's why the orders come in so quickly. Mary smiled. Why, thank you. I'm pleased you like the one I gave you for Christmas last year. Mary had made a business of carving Christmas ornaments and painting them. She even had a small advertisement in a Christmas catalog that went out every year. With a name like hers, and her occupation to boot, you'd think Christmas would be her favorite holiday. But Mary Winters had a secret. She hated Christmas. Her parents had been killed in a slaying accident, trying to beat a storm home on Christmas Eve when she'd been only 16. Her older sister, Carol, had invited her to live with her and her new husband. It had been fine then, but four years and two children later, the house was quite cramped. How's the mail-order bride business going, Elizabeth? Did I hear right that you started a newspaper? Elizabeth smiled, taking a couple of the boxes from Mary and motioning for her to precede her in line. I did start a newspaper. We're calling it the Groom's Gazette. There have been so many times I've thought about coming to you to be sent off as a bride but I just haven't found the courage to do it yet. Besides, I don't want to leave Carol and her family. If you ever do decide to be a mail-order bride, we'll find you the perfect man. I know you must have a hard time driving past the spot where your parents were killed every time you come into town. Mary frowned. It's so hard. I'm just happy that I still have a family here. Elizabeth put the boxes she held on the counter. It's shipping day, Mary announced with a smile. It feels like it's always shipping day. The postmistress smiled. You have a dozen more orders here. She handed the letters to Mary while she carefully inspected the packages that were ready to be mailed. After getting the money from Mary, she handed Elizabeth a pile of letters. Let's get a piece of pie. Elizabeth said. Mary nodded happily. She didn't usually take the time to spend with friends, because she was so busy with her ornament business. Alfred and Carol had fallen on hard times, and they counted on the money she was able to contribute to the family's income. She put half into the bank for her future, and the other half was happily given to her brother-in-law. I'd love to get pie. It's been forever since we sat down together. Elizabeth wound her arm through Mary's and the two ladies walked to the small cafe next door, taking a table off to the side. Your business is really growing, isn't it? Elizabeth asked, nodding at the orders in Mary's hand. 
Mary smiled. It amazes me how much people love my ornaments. I can barely keep up. I'm glad people appreciate the work you do. You have so much talent. I don't know about that, Mary looked down, embarrassed. She'd been told from a young age that she was a talented artist, but she'd never dreamed she'd be making a living that way. Elizabeth slid one of her letters open while Mary studied the menu. Mary knew her friend ate there more often than she did. Mary, say you'll be a mail-order bride. Mary lowered her menu and frowned at Elizabeth. I can't just run off and leave. Why do you want me to do it? Because I've found the perfect man for you. Mary frowned at her friend. And you can tell he's perfect for me from just one letter? I've been doing this job for a long time. Listen to this. Elizabeth cleared her throat and read the letter aloud. Dear Potential Bride, I'm ready to marry. I know that sounds strange, but I never thought I'd get to the point I am in life without having a bride waiting on me. I live in Mistletoe, Montana, and I own a bison ranch. I am exactly where I want to be financially to start a family, and it's time. I'm looking for a bride who is rather self-sufficient. I'd like her to be able to cook and clean, but if we need to, I can hire out for those tasks. More than anything, I want a wife who can stand on her own two feet and be independent. I want children. I'd like a bride between the ages of 20 and 25, who doesn't mind crossing the prairie by herself. A woman who won't be afraid if there's a snowstorm and she's trapped in the house for days on end. I need a woman who can be strong without a man to lean on. My name is Clyde Bellman, and I'm 28 years old. I have brown hair and brown eyes. If you think you'd be a good bride for me, I'd love to hear from you. Sincerely, Clyde. After Elizabeth finished the letter, she looked at Mary. He's described you perfectly. I know you're the wife for him. Mary sighed. I don't think I can do it right now. Carol still needs help with the little ones on occasion. Elizabeth sighed. Promise me you'll at least think about it. I want you to be happy. I'll think about it. But that's all you're getting from me. Give me an answer when you come into town next week. That'll still give me enough time to get his ad in the Groom's Gazette if we need to. Mary nodded reluctantly. She didn't see herself ready to go across the country in a week. There was no way. Asterisk. Three weeks later, Mary woke, in the middle of the night, feeling as if she was choking. The air was too thick to breathe and smelled of smoke. She hurried out of bed and ran for the children's room, calling for her sister and brother-in-law to wake up. There was a fire. She wasn't yet sure where it was coming from, but it was in their house, and they had to get out. She picked up little Adelaide and baby Joseph, running for the door of the small house she shared with her family. When she got to the door, she saw there was already a crowd forming, carrying water to the house and trying to put the fire out. She put the children down several feet from the house, coughing as she breathed deeply of the night air. She had to go back for Carol and Alfred. A hand on her arm stayed her progress, and she swatted it away as if it was a fly. Mary, you can't go back in there. Her eyes met those of her pastors, and she shook her head. I have to. My sister is still in there. She tore her arm from his grasp and ran, only to be caught from behind when two strong arms wrapped around her. The fire started in their bedroom. That whole part of the house is gone. Mary stared at the house for the first time since the fire had started. He was right. There was no way her sister had survived. She looked over at her small niece and nephew, tears making tracks through the soot that covered her face. How was she going to raise the two of them? Asterisk. At the funeral, Mary stood straight with her niece beside her, and her nephew in her arms. Joey was only ten months old, but at least he was old enough to drink from a cup and eat some table food. He wouldn't starve. As soon as the service was over, she turned her back, not having any need to dwell there. 
not when she had hungry children to feed. She said a silent prayer of thanks that she'd done her business from a small shed behind the main house, because that's where her orders and her stockpile of ornaments were. She had to be able to earn a living, now more than ever. Mary, stop. Mary turned and saw Elizabeth standing beside her, a sad look on her face. I'm so sorry about Carol and Alfred. Mary nodded, her lower lip trembling. Thank you. What are you going to do? Mary took a deep breath and forced her voice to stay soft, though she wanted to scream at the top of her lungs. Do? What I always do I suppose. I'll survive. Where are you staying? Elizabeth asked. The boarding house in town. Thank heavens I had money in the bank. Stay with me. I haven't had any inquiries on Clyde's ad. Go to him. Mary hadn't thought twice about the letter from the man needing a mail-order bride since she'd talked to Elizabeth and told her no two weeks before. It was already early November. A trip to Montana at this time of year didn't sound like it would be cozy. What man would take on a young woman with two children in tow? The children aren't even mine. Come stay with me, and write to him. My house is big, and you need a place to be other than the boarding house. You don't have to write to him to stay with me. Please, Mary? Mary closed her eyes for a moment. She hated the idea of taking charity from strangers, but she'd felt like nothing but a charity case for years. Finally, she nodded. Yes, we'll stay with you. She climbed into Elizabeth's buggy, the baby on her lap and little Adelaide sitting beside her. Adelaide kept crying for her mama, and Mary had no answers other than, she's sleeping with God. Elizabeth climbed into the front with Bernard, her longtime butler, who drove them all back to town. Stop at the boarding house for Mary to get her things. They're going to stay with us for a time. Bernard nodded and drove to the boarding house. There's very little for us to get from there. Most of our things were burned up in the fire, Mary said softly. Truthfully almost everything she'd saved was for her business. She'd replaced diapers for the baby and had purchased a couple of store-bought dresses for Adelaide and herself. Elizabeth turned to Mary with a frown. We'll have a couple of maids help you sew new things. I don't have time to sew. I have to get my orders out and tend to the children. Elizabeth reached behind her and put her hand on her friend's shoulder. I'll help with the children, and the maids will sew while you work. We're going to get through this. Mary closed her eyes against the tears that had sprung into them once again. There were times when she thought the well was dry and there were no more tears left inside her, and then someone did something kind for her, and she was crying again. I'm going to write to your Clyde. Elizabeth smiled. I really think you should. We'll get you settled in, put the children down for a nap, and we'll write a letter together. She looked a bit more closely at Mary. Better yet, we'll get the children down and their aunt down for a nap, and then we'll write a letter after she wakes. You looked exhausted, Mary. Mary yawned behind her hand. Every time they're sleeping, I feel like I need to be working. The boarding house provides meals, of course, but we're all three in a tiny room. I won't be able to keep paying for it if I don't work. Stop fretting. You need someone to lean on for a little while, and that someone is going to be me. I promise I will take good care of the three of you. Less than an hour later, Mary was settled in a bed in the mansion Elizabeth ran her business from. The children were in an adjoining room, and one of the maids had been set up as a nanny for them. Mary was able to close her eyes and not listen for the children for the first time since the fire. Two hours later, she woke up and brushed her hair, redoing the knot she kept it in. She walked down the stairs to find Elizabeth. Her friend was in her office, as usual, and she knocked on the door. Let's write that letter. I'm not trying to force you to write it, Elizabeth said softly. I would just like to see you get out of this town. I know you grew up here, but it can't hold happy memories for you. Mary sank onto the sofa and reached for the writing materials provided by her friend. 
Dear Clyde. When she had finished, she handed the letter to Elizabeth. I told him I run my own business and just inherited a three-year-old toddler girl and a ten-month-old boy. We'll see how fast he writes back to tell me to stay in Beckham. Elizabeth shook her head with a smile. I read between the lines better than that. He's going to marry you, and he's going to do it as soon as he can get you out to Montana. I hope so. I really do. Chapter 2 Clyde rode into town late on Saturday afternoon. It was the end of November, and he hadn't heard yet about a bride. He was beginning to think maybe he was unmarriageable. When he strode into the mercantile to get the mail, the proprietor, Colin Murphy, smiled at him and immediately started digging through the pile of letters in front of him. Got something for you, Bellman. Clyde took a deep breath, surprised that he was even a little bit nervous. It was time for him to marry, so there was no reason to be nervous. Not even one little bit. He walked to the counter and took the letter Mr. Murphy was holding out, walking over to sit in a small chair in front of the picture window to read it. Dear Clyde, I am interested in becoming your mail-order bride, if you'll have me. I'm twenty years old and have red hair and green eyes. I live in Beckham, Massachusetts. I have run my own business for more than three years, carving and painting Christmas tree ornaments. I have been living with my sister and brother-in-law, because my parents died four years ago, but my sister and brother-in-law have been killed in a fire. I'm now responsible for my niece and nephew aged three and ten months, respectively. If you want me for a bride, they will accompany me on my journey to Montana. I know this letter is probably not the most cheerful thing you've ever read, but I don't feel a whole lot of cheer right now. I grew up in Beckham and memories here are haunting me. I'd like to start fresh, and as an independent woman, I believe I fit your requirements. Thank you for considering me. Sincerely, Mary Winters. Clyde read over the letter once more, his heart going out to Mary, alone with two small children. She sounded perfect, because she not only ran her own business, but she had taken on the burden of raising someone else's children. Surely she would be a good person to help him grow his ranch. He walked across the street to the train station to get tickets. He thought to buy three, but he'd been informed that the baby would be able to sit in his aunt's lap. After he had the tickets in hand, he walked back over to the mercantile, borrowed a pencil and paper, and sat down to respond to the letter from Mary. Clyde included cash for the trip and a check for Miss Miller's fee before giving the sealed letter to Colin. I'd appreciate it if that went out on the first train available. He smiled, rubbing the back of his neck. He'd have a new family before Christmas. They'd arrive on the 12th of December. He couldn't help but feel sorry for his sweet Mary, because that trip would not be comfortable with two small children. He wished there was a way he could help her, but he knew there wasn't. As he rode back out to the ranch, he smiled to himself. He'd gotten a woman to agree to come to Montana, to marry him. In less than a month, he'd be a husband and a father to two small children. He had no worries over whether he'd make a good father, because he knew he would. It was the right time for him to marry, so obviously, he'd be good at it. He'd do everything he could to make the children feel welcome. Asterisk. Mary was in the room that had been designated as her workshop, which was adjacent to Elizabeth's office. She looked up at the knock on the door expecting to see the maid, Louise, who had been assigned to watch the children. Louise couldn't figure out how to please Adelaide, who still cried often for her mother, so she frequently asked Mary for advice. Instead, Elizabeth stood in front of her, holding up a letter. He responded? Mary felt her heart drop into her stomach. She didn't know if she wanted to snatch the letter from her friend in eagerness to leave, or never read it, so she never had to face the unknown with the children. She walked to her friend and took the letter from her, carefully opening it and sinking into her work chair to read it. As soon as she opened it, money fell out, along with a check made out to Elizabeth. Mary handed her friend the check and read the letter, trying to still her nerves. 
It wasn't like she was meeting him yet, and obviously, if he'd sent money, he wasn't rejecting her. Dear Mary, I'd be delighted to have you as my bride. You sound like the exact sort of woman I'm looking for. I've included two train tickets, one for you, and one for your niece. I understand the baby will be fine sitting on your lap. I wish I could find a way to make the journey easier for you, but I cannot take the time from my ranch to come out there to return with you. I wish I could. I would do it in a heartbeat. I will be in Mistletoe on the 12th at 2 in the afternoon to collect you and the children. I look forward to meeting you. It will be nice to not have to spend Christmas alone. Yours. Clyde. Mary smiled at her friend, feeling lost. She'd started a snowball down a hill, and as it gained traction, she became more and more nervous about it. It looks like I'll be leaving here on the 2nd. The date was printed on her ticket very clearly, and she knew it was the 2nd, but it still felt odd to say it. Elizabeth blinked. The 2nd? That's only three days away. We have a lot to do to get you ready. How many dresses are finished? They'd decided to have Mary's dresses made by a seamstress in town, so she wouldn't have to take time away from her work to make them. She was happy with the work the maids had done on clothing for little Adelaide and Joseph. Everything is finished. We don't have much, because of the fire, so it's just a matter of packing what we do have. Mary frowned. My only worry is the journey alone with two small children. Elizabeth frowned. I hadn't thought of that aspect of it. She thought for a moment, before sticking one finger in the air triumphantly. I know. My sister, Charlotte, can go with you to help with the children. Charlie? She's part of the demon horde. Elizabeth's younger brothers and sisters, all nine of them, had been referred to as the demon horde for years. Elizabeth sighed. Yes, she is, but she's out of school now, and she's been a real help to my mother. She's grown up a great deal. Do you really think she'll help me instead of getting in the way? Absolutely. I wouldn't have suggested her as a traveling companion otherwise. She wants to see the world before she settles down, so I think she'd be very happy with a free trip to Montana. I'll even pay her way. Mary shook her head emphatically. You will not. If she's going with me, I'm paying. I'm the one who needs help with the children, not you. I have the money saved, and it doesn't sound like Clyde is short of funds. Elizabeth bit her lip, obviously wanting to help. All right. I'll send Bernard out with a letter for my mother to see if Charlie wants to go. I do think she'll be ecstatic at the mere idea. Mary nodded. I'm going to finish up the last of the ornaments that I have orders for before leaving. I've already talked to the postmistress about all of my letters being forwarded should I decide to leave town. Sounds good. I'll go write that letter and you paint. You're leaving in three days. Elizabeth frowned. I'm just sorry you'll need to work on the Sabbath. Mary shrugged. The world won't end. God understands when we're in a rush to get everything done before we travel across the entire country to marry a total stranger. Elizabeth grinned. I have a feeling he does. She hurried from the room to take care of her tasks. By supper time, Bernard had returned from his errand with Charlotte Miller in tow. She'd already packed and decided to come early so she could help with anything that needed to be done before the trip. After supper, Charlie and Mary sat down to plan out their adventure. I'd appreciate it if you would pack the children's things while I continue to work to get myself ready. Make sure you leave out everything they'll need before the trip. Charlie nodded. Yes, of course. I look forward to getting to know them. Addie is still very traumatized about losing her mother. When she mentions her, or cries for her, kindly remind her that her mother is sleeping in heaven now. It's the only thing that seems to calm her. Joey doesn't seem to have noticed anything happened. He's the same happy child he's always been. 
He's content if his diaper is dry and he's allowed to crawl everywhere. Charlie smiled. I have a lot of experience with small children. I know you do. You come from a huge family. Mary paused for a moment, choosing her words carefully. I was nervous about having one of the demon horde travel with me, but I really do need the help. I hope you're ready for this kind of responsibility. I am. It's my younger siblings who make up the demon horde now. You never know. I might find a young man in Montana and never return. That would be nice, Mary responded. She was surprised to find that she liked the other girl. Charlotte had been a couple of grades behind her in school, and as far as Mary had seen, she'd been one of the worst of the Miller children. She was different now. Calmer. I'll be the best traveling companion you ever dreamed of having. I promise. Charlie jumped up and paced back and forth. I'll get the children packed, and I have a good hand with a paintbrush if you need help with ornaments as well. Mary was surprised at the offer. She considered for a moment before shaking her head. I appreciate it, but I feel like people have paid for my work, so that's what they should get. Charlie nodded. I understand. I'm going to go get started packing. Mary smiled at the enthusiasm, walking to her workroom to get back to it. There were still several ornaments that needed to be finished before she felt like she could leave to go to Montana. Asterisk. Just after noon on the 12th of December, Clyde hitched up the sleigh to drive to the train station. The snow from the recent storm was deeper than he could go through using the buggy, so the sleigh would be the only way. He was excited to meet his new bride and had arranged for their wedding to take place an hour after her arrival. He'd made arrangements with Colin and Doreen Murphy for her to get cleaned up at their home before the wedding. He couldn't believe that in a few short hours, he'd be married and the father of two children. When he arrived in town, it was still half an hour before the train was supposed to arrive. The day was much too cold for him to wait out in the open, so he wandered into the mercantile to talk to Colin Murphy. Thanks for letting my new family get ready for the wedding at your place. I really do appreciate it. Are you ready for this? It's a lot of responsibility to take on not only a wife, but two young UNS all at once. Clyde shrugged. It's time. I'm more than ready. I should probably get them each a welcome gift, though, shouldn't I? He wandered around the store, finding a soap that smelled of roses that he thought would be perfect for Mary. Now to find something for the children. I have a new wooden train in. It might be nice for the boy. Colin called, not leaving his spot behind the counter. Where is it? With the other toys, along the back wall. Clyde found the toy train and picked it up, checking to see if there were small pieces. He'd heard that children stuck everything in their mouths, and he didn't want to be responsible for the boy choking. Buying him another gift on top of the ones in the boy's new room at his home might be overdoing it a bit, but at least the family would feel welcomed. Then his eyes fell on a doll. He picked it up, smoothing the long blonde hair. The silk dress was pink and she wore tiny little white leather shoes. Yes, this would be perfect for his new little girl. She'd been through a lot, losing both parents at such a young age, so he needed her to feel wanted. Already he worried about the boys that would someday come to court his daughter. He'd hold them off with a rifle if he needed to. He took the three purchases to the counter. Should I buy her some supplies as well? He looked at Colin with wide eyes. How was he supposed to know what a wife would want? Have you been taking your meals with the boys in the bunkhouse? Colin asked. Clyde nodded. Yeah, I don't have much in the way of food in the house. I'll put together a box of the basics for you then, and put it on your account. When ladies come in here setting up household for the first time, they all get the same things. Sounds good. I hope she doesn't mind cooking for a bit. I haven't hired a cook yet, and I offered to do that. I know she runs her own business, so she's going to want to have more time than cooking and cleaning will allow her to have. 
Colin shrugged. I'm sure she'll be fine with it until you can hire someone. You have anyone in mind? Clyde shrugged. No idea. I'm sure there's got to be some young lady needing a job around town though. Colin didn't respond as he quickly gathered things to put into a box for his friend. I'll put the box in your sleigh during the wedding. You can pick it up on your way home. Go meet your new family. It's time. Clyde pulled his watch from the pocket of his suit that was usually only worn on Sundays. It really was time. He took a deep breath and walked across the street, carrying the three gifts for his new family. Hopefully, they'd be happy with them. Chapter 3 Clyde stood at the edge of the train platform, watching as a few people got off the train. This was only a whistle stop, so only the people who would actually stay there in mistletoe would be getting off. His eyes stayed on the door as an older gentleman got off, then a middle-aged mother with two teens. Finally, a young lady with flowing blonde hair climbed off, holding the hand of a little girl, followed by a woman with fiery red hair, holding a baby. The second woman must be her. She'd said she had red hair. He'd imagined more of a strawberry blonde, but this woman had hair a deep shade of red. She stood looking out over the few people who were gathered, and he could feel her gaze when it landed on him. He gave a slight nod and strode forward, wondering if the blonde was with her, and if not, where Adelaide was. He walked to her and stared into her eyes, surprised at how pretty she was. Why would such a pretty lady want to travel so far to become a mail-order bride? It didn't make sense to him, but it wasn't his job to make sense of anything. It was his job to accept his new family. I'm Clyde. He said the words as if he were announcing something and immediately wished he could start over. First impressions were so important. A small smile tilted the woman's lips. I'm Mary. This is Joseph. She put her hand on the shoulder of the little girl. This is Adelaide. It's nice to meet you all, he said. He looked at the blonde woman and when no one offered an explanation, he blurted out his questions. Who are you? I'm Charlotte, but everyone just calls me Charlie. I came along with Mary as her traveling companion to help with the children. He was surprised by the answer, nodding after a moment. It's nice to meet you, Charlie. I'm the matchmaker's younger sister. I see. He didn't mind that she was there, exactly, but it did seem strange to him. Shouldn't he have been consulted? Was he expected to pay for her train fare? Mary smiled at him, distracting him from Charlie. Charlie's going to stay for a week or so before heading home to Massachusetts. She's never been out of the state and wanted to come with me. She's been a godsend. Clyde finally nodded. Thank you for being willing to help out. Of course. I'll stay as long as I'm needed as well. He nodded. I've arranged for you to get cleaned up before the wedding, which is going to take place in a little less than an hour. Mary nodded, smiling. That sounds wonderful. After ten days on a train, I'd do anything to be clean. The owner of the mercantile and his wife have said you could get ready there. He looked down at the gifts in his hand. Oh, and I got everyone gifts. He gave Joseph the train he was holding, and the boy immediately stuck it into his mouth as he'd expected. Then he knelt down so he was eye-level with Adelaide. I got you a doll. Do you like dolls? She nodded, her face very serious. Yes, thank you. She took the doll from him, staring at her. I'll take good care of her. He smiled, happy to have found the right gift for the girl, before standing up straight to give Mary the bar of soap. My gift for you is more personal. I hope you like the smell of roses. She nodded, taking it from him. Thank you, Clyde. He led them across the platform to the Murphy's house, knocking hard on the door. Mrs. Murphy opened it immediately. Come in. We've been expecting you. I'm Doreen Murphy. I have a tub of water already. 
She looked between the two ladies. How many wives does one rancher need? Charlie grinned. I'm just the traveling companion, ma'am. I came along to help with the babies. I see. Well, let's get everyone cleaned up. Mrs. Murphy made a shooing motion with her hand. Go get their things loaded on your sleigh. They're mine for the next hour. As soon as he was gone, Mary smiled gratefully. Can I let the baby lie down for a bit? He hasn't had his nap yet. Of course. Mrs. Murphy reached out and took Joseph from her. I have a bath set up in the kitchen. I won't let anyone in the house, and I barred the door to keep even my husband out. You get your bath, and I'll see to the children. She reached a hand down to take Adelaide's hand, and took both of the children into another room. Mary looked at Charlie. Do you mind if I bathe first? I'll wait until tonight to bathe. You're the one getting married, so you go ahead. I'll help you with your hair when you're done. Mary nodded. Normally she would have given up the right to go first, but Charlie was correct. It was her wedding night and she did need to look and smell her best. She carefully unwrapped the soap and set it on the edge of the tin tub. I sure hope Clyde has a big bathtub. She sighed. What did it matter if the man had a big tub? He was big, almost frighteningly so. Would she be able to submit to him? After she'd bathed, Charlie fixed her hair into an intricate style, and she quickly pulled on the dress she'd brought for the wedding. It was more wrinkled than she would have liked, but she had no other choices at the moment. Just as they were finishing, Mrs. Murphy came hurrying into the room. I got the children cleaned up as best I could. We can't really waste any more time. We're already five minutes late for the wedding. Asterisk. Clyde stood at the front of the congregation at the schoolhouse, trying to be still. The church was closed because it was being used as an infirmary, but he wouldn't feel any less married if the ceremony was performed in a schoolhouse than he would in a church. He was a man of action and not moving was difficult for him. He checked his watch for the fifth time in as many minutes, before looking at Pastor Bart Nichols. I hope she didn't decide not to go through with it. Women take their time getting ready for weddings. Don't you worry. She'll be here. I hope so. Clyde could see his former love, Miss Marjorie Dalrymple, staring at him from the third pew back. She was holding her baby and sitting awfully close to her husband. Clyde didn't much care about who saw him get left at the altar, as long as Marjorie Dalrymple Black wasn't one of them. When the door at the back of the school opened, and he saw Charlie walk in with the children, he drew a deep breath of relief. She was coming. She wouldn't have sent Charlie and the children ahead if she wasn't. Mrs. Murphy walked in, sitting beside Charlie. He assumed she was going to help with the children if they became unruly. He certainly hoped his new children would never be unruly. He frowned at the thought. He'd have to talk to Mary about that later and get an idea of how well-behaved the children were. The door of the school opened again, and his bride began to walk slowly toward him. She didn't hold a bouquet of flowers, which disappointed him until he realized there would have been no way for her to get her hands on flowers, unless he'd ordered them. She'd been traveling for ten days. How could she have even thought of such a thing? When Mary reached him, he smiled at her, taking her hand and tucking it into his arm. Pastor Bart nodded for everyone to quiet down. Dearly beloved. The familiar words of the wedding ceremony made Mary more nervous than she already was. She quivered visibly, and then was ashamed of herself. Poor Clyde. What must he think of her? When the pastor said, You may kiss the bride, Mary turned to Clyde, peering up at him through her eyelashes. He was a stranger to her, and she was married to him. He was about to kiss her for the first time, and she wasn't sure she was ready. Of course, that wouldn't matter at all. She had to do her duty and kiss her new husband, for herself and for the children she'd agreed to care for. 
She raised her lips and closed her eyes as Clyde lowered his head, his lips brushing her softly. He didn't take advantage of the kiss, instead stopping with just that soft touch. She sighed with relief. She wanted her first real kiss to be without people watching her. They walked together to the back of the school, where the children were, and Clyde got down on one knee so he could talk to them. I'm going to do everything I can to give you the best upbringing I know how. Joey hit him on the head with his new toy train, garbling unintelligibly, while Adelaide stared at him with wide eyes. Auntie Mary said you would be our Uncle Clyde, she said very seriously, her words enunciated perfectly. I'm going to be your uncle. I'm going to be the best uncle anyone ever had. I will take care of you. All right. Adelaide nodded, putting her free hand in his. Her other arm still clutched the doll she carried. Clyde looked at Mary. I have the sleigh loaded. Let's head home. I'll introduce you to everyone after services on Sunday. Mary nodded, her eyes as serious as her niece's. That sounds good to me. He frowned as Charlie walked outside with them. He didn't want her staying with them. He knew it was irrational and unreasonable. Mary would have had a very hard time making it all the way to Montana with two small children with no help. But they were his now, and they didn't need Charlie any longer. He led Mary out to the sleigh, still keeping Adelaide's hand in his. When they reached the sleigh, he lifted up the little girl and then offered his hand to her aunt. I'm glad you came all this way to marry me. I can tell you're going to make me very happy. I hope so. Mary sat down, sliding to the middle of the seat and pulling Adelaide onto her lap. Charlie handed little Joey to her and she snuggled him close. We get to see our new home. Aren't you glad? Joey was tired, and his eyes looked sunken to her. He'd lost a little weight since his mother had died, but she hoped he'd put it right back on. She worried about both of the children, because people around her always seemed to die. Sure, it was always in an accident, but maybe she was somehow causing it. Charlie climbed in beside her, tucking the edge of the lap robe under her and immediately taking Adelaide to hold on the way home. Clyde slid into the seat on her other side, and he raised a hand in a wave to the people standing outside the school watching them. Mistletoe had been his home since he was a very young man, and he was happy to have the people he cared about surrounding him on such a special occasion. Mary fought to keep her eyes open for the twenty-minute drive out to the ranch. She knew she should be making conversation, but she was so tired. There had been very little sleeping done on that train, stopping so often along the way. Clyde started to ask Mary a question, but just as he looked at her, her eyes closed, and her head fell over to rest against his shoulder. Charlie didn't look quite as tired as his bride, but all four of the travelers looked like they'd been through a lot. He'd let his bride sleep until they reached the ranch. There was time enough for talking. They had their whole lives ahead of them, after all. When he pulled into the yard of the house, he took the baby from her and saw that he'd fallen asleep clutching the toy train. He climbed out carefully, realizing he should have left the babe with her, but he was unwilling to admit defeat. Mary, we're home. It's time to wake up. Mary woke with a start, staring at the huge house in front of her. She'd expected a small home, like she'd shared with her sister and brother-in-law, but this house was big. It wasn't nearly as large as Elizabeth Miller's, of course, but it was the perfect size for a growing family. She got out of the sleigh and took Adelaide from Charlie, who was staring at the house herself. Clyde watched his bride as she got her first look at the house he'd built for her, and smiled at her look of astonishment. He wanted to brag to her that he'd done it all with no mortgage, but he knew it wasn't the time. Every stick and rock and brick was his, though, and he was mighty proud of that fact. He led them into the house, still carrying the baby, and opened the front door. It opened into a nice large room that was a combination living and dining area. There was a wall, and the kitchen was on the other side. He was quite proud of the kitchen, knowing it would make any housewife happy. 
may I show you around, he asked softly. Yes, please. Clyde gave the baby to Charlie, and took Adelaide from Mary's arms, setting her onto the floor. He then took Mary's hand and led her into the kitchen, showing her the nice stove and the sink with a pump for water. You won't have to carry water into the house. You can pump it right at the sink. Mary smiled. I see that. She hoped there wouldn't be a lot of cooking for her to do, but she didn't feel like she could immediately ask about the woman he'd said he'd hire for cooking and cleaning. He opened the pantry to show her how well the food storage had been delineated. I have food in the sleigh that I'll bring in. I just want to show you around first. Thank you. This house looks like a wonderful place to raise the children. Her eyes fell on the icebox in one corner of the room. She'd seen them, of course, but her family had never been wealthy enough to own one. He looked at her with a smile. I hope to raise the two we already have and lots more here. He caught her hand and pulled her toward him. I want to kiss you again, without all of mistletoe, Montana watching us. Mary was nervous, but she nodded. Of course. You're my husband. He grinned at that, his finger tracing her lips. I guess I am. I'm going to keep you. She shook her head. You don't need to tell me that. Marrying me was enough. He lowered his head slowly, his lips brushing her softly, and then his hands came to her waist, pulling her against him. She could feel his strength through his suit, and she felt more than a little overwhelmed by the sheer size of him. You make me feel like I'm tiny. He laughed softly. You are tiny compared to me. Lowering his head again, he kissed her, the kiss deeper this time, and when he lifted his head, he could see that her eyes were not as focused. I know you've had it rough, but from here on out, your life is going to be much better. She smiled, resting her head on his shoulder. Thank you. She hoped he was right. Chapter 4 When Mary saw the bathroom, she let out a little squeal and clapped her hands. She'd lived her whole life without one, but a few weeks in Elizabeth's home had gotten her to where she wanted to have the luxury of an indoor bathroom forever. I can't believe you have a bathroom. He grinned, watching her. I built this house, knowing that one day, I'd bring my bride here. I wanted that bride to have everything she could possibly want or need. That included a bathroom. I love it. I'm glad. He took her hand and headed for the stairway. The bedrooms are up here. I chose one for each of the kids and tried to make them feel at home there. He opened the first door at the top of the stairs. This is our room. He paid a neighbor woman to come in and do a thorough cleaning the day before, so he knew it would be clean enough for any woman. She looked at the big bed in the middle of the room, swallowing hard. I'm not sure if I'll be ready to share a bed tonight. He shrugged. I want to share the bed and the room, even if we don't make love. I don't want Charlie thinking anything. Charlie? What do her thoughts matter? He frowned. I just want her to think our marriage is a normal one. She knows we met today, and I came here as a mail-order bride. I know. I just don't want her to know if we don't make love. Mary studied him for a moment, before agreeing. That's fine. I won't say a word. Good. He pulled her down the hall a little to the next room. It had a crib against one wall and there were blocks on the floor. It looked ready to be played in. Mary knew it would look just perfect once she put Joseph's blanket into the crib. His mother had made it for him, and it had only been saved from the fire, because he'd been wrapped in it when Mary had carried him out. The room is lovely. Thank you for getting him a crib. Of course. He's mine now too. He closed the door and walked to the next room. She smiled when she looked into it. There was a small bed with ruffles on the cover. Several stuffed animals were lying on the bed, ready for their new little girl to arrive. Addie will love this. Addie? Do you call her Addie? 
Mary nodded. I go back and forth. I call her Adelaide half the time and Addie the other half. The same with Joey. Do you mind if I do the same? She shook her head. No, of course not. He led her to the last bedroom. I guess for now, this will be Charlie's room. It was sparsely furnished, but knowing that she'd had to share her room with three sisters at home, Mary knew her friend would like it. There was one more door, and she looked at it for a moment. What's there? It's been empty, and I always figured I'd use it for something. When you told me about your business, I did what I could to make it a room for you. He opened the door and watched her face, hoping he'd done well. He'd stayed up late into the night since he'd gotten her letter, hoping to make it just perfect. Mary stepped into the room, tears filling her eyes. It's perfect. There were two tables that she could use as work tables, each with a chair. The walls were covered with shelves, but not just any shelves, they were almost like little printer's drawers turned sideways. The shelves had little holes where the ornaments could easily be stored, so she could build up an inventory, something she'd never had time to do. I didn't know what kind of paint you'd want, so I didn't get any of that. His hands were in his pockets, and he looked a bit nervous about her reaction to the room. She turned to him, rushing at him and throwing her arms around him. Thank you so much. No one has ever done anything this kind for me before. She sniffled, rubbing a tear away. I'm glad you like it. I'm sorry about the paint. I brought my own paint. I'll have to order the kind I like. You did a perfect job. I feel bad that I didn't have a tree set up when you got here, but we'll pick one out together. Did you bring ornaments to put on it, or will you make them as we go? He asked. He loved Christmas, because to him it was a symbol of all that was right with the world. His sweet little bride being an ornament maker filled him with pride. She shook her head. I don't have any ornaments at all. He frowned at that. I guess that's like the cobbler's kids going without shoes. You should make one ornament for each of us every year, so we all have something special every Christmas. Obviously he loved the idea of them each having an ornament, and he'd already done more for her than she'd imagined he would, so she nodded slowly. Sure. I can do that. This is going to be the best Christmas ever. Mary smiled. I'll do my best to make it perfect for you. She hoped he would get so caught up in his love of the holiday that he didn't notice her feelings about it at all. When they joined the others downstairs, Charlie was sitting on the sofa holding baby Joey, who was sound asleep. Adelaide was lying on her side with her head on Charlie's lap. I didn't know if I should let them sleep or keep them awake, so they'll sleep tonight. Mary shook her head. We're all so exhausted. Just let them sleep if they can now. It might take me a week or two to get them back into a regular routine, but they need sleep. I don't think it'll even disturb their rest tonight with as little as they've gotten in the past week. She turned to Clyde. We haven't eaten since lunchtime, and it's after six. I hope you have some magic food that doesn't take long to cook. I didn't think about supper. He sighed. I was so busy showing my new bride the house that I forgot about the children needing to eat. Let me go get the supplies in. He hurried to the door, pulling on his coat and hat, before rushing out to the sleigh. Mary smiled at Charlie. Thanks for staying to help with the children. I'm not sure if I'm ready to be their full-time caretaker. I've had people helping, except for the two days after their parents died. I'll stay as long as you need me. Although, Charlie broke off, biting her lip. Although what? What's wrong? I don't think Clyde likes me very much. Don't be silly. Clyde likes everyone from what I can see. He's already got beds and toys for the children. Oh, and there's a nice spare room for you, and he made me a workroom. It's got everything we need. Charlie smiled, nodding. I'm sure you're right. I'm glad you're happy with the house. So happy. I'm going to like it here. 
Of course you will. My sister always gets the matches, just right. Mary smiled. She's a bit of a genius when it comes to finding the right man for a woman. Clyde came in with the supplies then, carrying them into the kitchen and putting them on the counter. I'll let you put things where you want them. Mary hurried into the kitchen, digging through the box. Would you be all right with pancakes and bacon for supper? It's a fast easy meal, and we can get the children to bed at a decent hour. He nodded. Sounds good to me. I'll get the rest of your things in and unhitch the team. I should have done that already. I guess having a new wife distracts me too much. Does that mean you want me to go? Mary asked with a smile. I wouldn't let you if you tried. Asterisk. An hour later, the children had been fed, tucked in, and Mary was ready to go up to bed. It was dark out, and she was exhausted, having not slept well on the train even once. Charlie helped her with the dishes, and when they were finished whispered, I'll listen for the children tonight. I don't want you to worry about them at all. I'll do my best. Mary responded, hugging her friend. I was nervous about bringing a member of the demon horde with me, but you've made this trip so much easier for me. Thank you. Charlie hugged her back. I told you, I'm not the same girl you knew in school. Good night. And thank you for all your help. I'm here for as long as you need me. I appreciate that. Mary turned toward the stairs. Have you seen your room yet? Charlie shook her head. I didn't know if I should ask. Of course you should. You need to know where you'll sleep. Come on. I'll show you, and then I'm going to bed. A short while later, Mary hurriedly changed into her nightgown and slid between the covers. Clyde had told her he'd give her ten minutes before coming into bed. She lay there, waiting nervously for him. He'd never said for certain whether or not he was granting her the time she wanted to get used to him before they made love. He'd made her feel like he probably would, but she wasn't certain. Everything was so uncertain now. She thought she was glad to have made the journey across the prairie to him, but it was hard to know for certain just yet. He'd been great, but there was no telling what a man was really like until you'd lived with him. She'd never forget the talk Elizabeth had with her about getting away if he was unkind to her. She wouldn't stay in a situation like that, and she certainly wouldn't allow the children to stay. She turned to her side, facing the center of the bed, wishing he'd hurry. She was getting more nervous by the moment. Finally, the door opened, and she heard Clyde undressing in the dark. Are you still awake? he asked softly. For a moment, she thought about feigning sleep, but then she answered. Yes, I'm awake. He slid into the bed beside her, pulling her close. I'm not going to ask you to do anything tonight, but I'd like it if I could hold you while I sleep. Like Addie holds her dolls, she asked, amused. Did she like the doll I got her? he asked. I'm sure she did. She lost all her toys in the fire so I'm sure she's grateful for anything. Clyde stroked his hand over her hair. How long ago was the fire? She sighed. November. I'd already decided not to respond to your letter when the fire happened. He pulled away a bit, trying to see her face in the darkness. Why weren't you going to respond? She shrugged. I wanted to. I had lunch with Elizabeth the day she got the letter and she told me it had been written for me. She was quiet for a moment, struggling to find the right words to explain how she'd felt. My parents died when I was sixteen. My sister was newly married, but she and her husband didn't hesitate to invite me to live with them in the tiny little house they had. I helped my sister with the children, and I helped with expenses with my business. I didn't feel like I could leave right then. But then the fire happened. She nodded. Yeah, and I lost the last of my connections to Beckham. My parents died there, and then my sister and her husband died there. I have no desire to ever go back. I needed to be away from there, so I answered your letter. 
Did you want to marry? She thought about that for a moment. I did. I think. I never really thought about it a lot. I know girls are supposed to live for the day they will someday be a wife, but for me, it wasn't like that. I probably would have been waiting for a bow like everyone else if my parents hadn't died when they did. Instead, I worked hard so I wouldn't be a burden on my sister. I felt like a charity case for four years. He frowned. I guess I never thought of it that way. It seems strange that you weren't really looking to marry, but yet you answered my letter. I wasn't looking to marry anyone from Beckham. I had no preference about people outside of Massachusetts. I didn't want to stay there where all the memories were bad ones. So are you glad you decided to marry and made the journey all the way to Montana? Ask me that again in a couple of weeks, and maybe I'll have an answer. For now, I don't. I think I made the right decision to leave Massachusetts and bring the children west. I don't think I could have done it on my own, so I'm probably glad I did it this way. We'll see. He kissed her forehead. How long do you want to wait before we consummate? Are you thinking months? She shrugged. I'm really not sure. I hope not months. I would like some time to get to know you first, though. I believe that's a reasonable request. We'll get to know one another, but while we're getting to know one another, I get to hold you at night. And kiss you when I feel like it. She laughed softly. I think that's perfectly fair. We'll take it from there. She didn't add that she found him very attractive, because she didn't want to be forward. It felt so strange lying in bed with him, with nothing but her nightgown between them. He kissed her softly, as he had in the school that day. Go to sleep, Mary. We'll worry about everything after you're rested. She sighed, burrowing closer. That sounded like the perfect solution to her. Good night, Clyde. Thank you for making us feel so welcome. You're my new family. You are welcome. Chapter 5 Their first day on the ranch went well. Mary woke early to fix breakfast, while Clyde fed the horses and milked the two cows he kept in the barn. He also gathered eggs, bringing the milk and eggs to her. Charlie came down with both children in tow as Mary was putting breakfast on the table. She gave Mary a repentant look. I'm sorry I wasn't up early enough to help with breakfast. Clyde washed his hands, looking at Mary, wondering how she'd react. Mary simply shrugged. I'm just glad you brought the children down, and you get to cook lunch. That sounds like a good idea to me. Charlie looked down at Addie. Do you want to help me cook lunch? Is Aunt Mary going to be working all day? Mary frowned. She had been planning to do some work that day, because she wanted to have a good inventory ready for next Christmas. How about I work half the day, and the other half we all spend together? Will you work after lunch, so we don't miss you so much? Mary grinned, understanding what the girl was asking immediately. Yes, I'll work during nap time, and we'll spend the morning together. She helped the girl onto a chair with a pillow under her bottom, so she'd be tall enough to eat, while she sat down, holding her hands out for Joey. Charlie immediately understood, handing her the boy and getting up to serve the eggs, bacon, and toast that Mary had fixed. I'm going to cook lunch and supper today. Will that work, Mary? Mary nodded, pleased. She would be able to get more of her work done if she had help with the meals and the children. She loved both of them dearly, but she needed time for her work as well. No, she probably didn't need to work any longer, but she enjoyed making simple things for people to enjoy. And she had promised Clyde that she would make ornaments for each of them before Christmas. That would be her first priority. Clyde watched the women interact with each other, noting they seemed to be able to communicate without words. The way they passed the children around and shared the chores seemed to be well rehearsed. How long have the two of you been friends, he asked. Mary grinned over at Charlie, who ducked her head. We actually went to school together. 
Charlie's brothers and sisters made up something the whole town called the Demon Horde, because they were the most unruly and out-of-control children in the whole area. The Demon Horde? Clyde looked at Charlie. Charlie nodded. Yes. It seems that as we grow up, we're not as bad. The nine younger than me are definitely still living up to the name though. That's awful. Clyde said, shocked. Oh, trust me. The name was well-deserved. I'm not sure how much influence I want you having on Addie and Joey then. I don't want them to start misbehaving the way you did. He couldn't imagine what Mary was thinking, allowing someone who'd made that sort of name for herself to be around the children so much. Charlie rolled her eyes. It's not like I'm teaching them to put reptiles in their teacher's drawers or showing them how to climb trees and throw apple cores at everyone who drives by. Did you do those things? He asked, one eyebrow raised. Charlie put the food on the table, her hand lovingly stroking Addie's hair, before she took her seat. Of course. It's part of being a member of the demon horde. Didn't it bother you that people called you that? He'd known some unruly children, but never had he heard a group of them receive a name like that. They must have been awful. She shrugged. I think it would have if it had only been me. But it wasn't. It was all of us. As she watched the two of them interact, Mary realized she wanted Charlie to stay, not just until they were settled but forever. She was already good with the children, and she could do any of the housekeeping and cooking that were too much for Mary while she was working. She made a mental note to talk to Clyde about it after breakfast. Clyde watched his new family as they ate. Mary fed the baby his eggs with a spoon, but let him hold his own toast that he pounded on the table repeatedly. Addie held a spoon with one hand but seemed to prefer to eat with her other hand. He couldn't help but wonder if she was too old to be eating with her fingers. And his new bride ate very little food herself, her face still looked drawn and tired, though the absolute exhaustion of the day before seemed to be a thing of the past. She had slept soundly last night. Every time he'd woken up, he'd listened for her even breathing. He was surprised at just how attracted he was to her, when they'd never really met before their wedding day. She was someone he would have chosen out of a room full of beautiful women. As soon as breakfast was over, Mary looked at Charlie. Would you watch the children for a minute or two? I'll be back to help with the dishes, so don't do them without me. Charlie made a shooing motion with her hand. Go. I'll take care of the kids. Mary frowned at her friend, immediately realizing she hadn't promised not to clean. She followed Clyde into the other room. I was thinking. Clyde caught her hand and pulled her to him for a kiss. You were thinking you'd miss me while I was out working all day? She grinned at him. That too, of course. She kissed his cheek. No, I was thinking that it would be nice if maybe Charlie could stay. You said you wanted to hire someone to help with the cooking and cleaning. The children already know her, and I happen to know she's an excellent cook. I know we work well together. Would you mind if she stayed? He frowned for a moment. I was thinking of someone from town. Are you sure she's a good influence on the children? Mary shook her head. She doesn't act like she's part of the demon horde anymore. She's really very good with both of them. I don't want to have to get used to someone new. I want Charlie. He sighed. I suppose if you want her to stay, she can stay. What's a fair wage? Mary shrugged. I have no idea. She'll be getting room and board, so that helps. I'm sure I'll be able to pay her for my profits, so it won't be something you need to worry about at all. No, I'll pay her. He frowned. I'm just not sure if she's the right choice. You don't like Charlie, do you? She told me last night you didn't, but I didn't really believe her until now. He sighed. It's not that I don't like her. She seems nice enough. I just, I'm being unreasonable. Of course you should be able to work with someone you're comfortable with. Ask her. 
he leaned down and kissed her cheek. Have a good day, and try to think of me on occasion. I'll be home for lunch around noon. He still had reservations about Charlie, but he felt like he could trust Mary, who knew her a great deal better than he did. How could he not trust a woman who fulfilled obligations the way Mary did? Thank you. He smiled at her. I'm beginning to think there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Mary watched him leave, standing idle for a moment, before going to the kitchen. The dishes were half done, and little Addie was sitting on the floor, entertaining her little brother. I told you to wait for me with the dishes. Charlie smiled at Mary over her shoulder. There weren't many, and I really don't mind. I'm in Montana. She said the last word with so much enthusiasm, as if she'd waited to go to Montana her entire life. Mary laughed. I'm glad you're enjoying your time away from Massachusetts. Charlie sighed. It's not just seeing a new place, although it's beautiful here. It's, well, I'm tired of the way everyone treats me in Beckham. It's like I'm a woman of loose morals trying to live among them. Do you realize I've never had a boy want to court me? I'm not surprised, Mary responded softly. As pretty as you are, your reputation as a prankster was pretty bad. Rumor had it that half the things you and your siblings did were your ideas. They were. That's not just a rumor. But I'm different now, and it's nice to be around people who have no memories of me being one of the Miller kids. Here, I'm just a young lady like all the others. Mary picked up a cloth to dry the dishes. She quickly wiped them and put them away as fast as her friend could wash. I was just talking to Clyde. We want you to stay. I'll pay you a good wage to help with the housework, cook, and help with the children. Everything wouldn't be your responsibility, but it would be a shared responsibility. She held her breath for a moment as she waited for the other woman's response. Charlie bit her lip, looking at Mary. And Clyde agreed to this? Really? Mary laughed, nodding. Really? He doesn't want you to be a bad influence on the children, but other than that he's all for it. I explained we work well together, and I didn't want to have to get used to someone new. I'd love to take the job. I don't know what a fair wage is, though. I'll write your sister and ask her. Good idea. She has enough people in that mansion of hers, she's sure to know the answer. I'm excited that you're willing to stay. Mary said. I was reluctant when Elizabeth first recommended you, but she was right. You were perfect for the job as a traveling companion, and I'm sure you'll be perfect for this too. She was quiet for a moment. And it'll be nice for you to meet men here who are unaware of your past shenanigans. Do you think I'll ever live them down? Mary shrugged. You won't have to live them down if no one here knows about them. Is that being deceptive? I don't think so. I don't plan on telling Clyde every little thing about me. Charlie looked at Mary in surprise. You won't? Really? He doesn't need to know about the nightmares I had after my parents died or how guilty I felt living with my sister and her husband, does he? Probably not. Charlie frowned. I never said it to you in school, but I felt really bad when you lost your parents. And on Christmas Eve, it would have been even worse. I'm very sorry you lost them. Thank you. Mary had said the words a hundred times as people offered their sympathies. They were meaningless by this point. I should have said something when it happened, but I was wrapped up in my own world. Planning how you were going to tie the teacher into the outhouse the next time she went. Mary asked, needing a subject change. That prank had been a favorite of the demon horde, and had been played on each new teacher. The teachers at their school never lasted more than a semester. Never. I was deciding which of my brothers would tie her shoelaces together around the foot of her chair so she wouldn't be able to get up to teach. Mary laughed softly, surprised by the sound of it. It had been a long time since she'd felt like laughing, and she realized she was starting to do it more and more. All the teachers always knew it was you. 
I always thought they should get a male teacher in there who would be more authoritative. They probably should have. But they never did. Aunt Mary? Addie said, interrupting them. Mary turned around. Yes, Addie? May I go get baby ugly hair, please? Mary blinked a couple of times. Baby ugly hair? Your new doll? Addie nodded. She has very ugly hair, don't you think? Mary smiled. I didn't look at her closely enough to know. I want a baby that has hair like Penelope had. Mary knew Penelope had been Addie's favorite doll. Her mother had gotten it for her the previous Christmas. I'll see what I can do to make that happen. I'm sorry Penelope was lost in the fire. Addie nodded regally. Me too. I miss her almost as much as I miss Mama and Daddy. Mary squatted down to hug her niece tightly. I miss them too. Are you my new Mama? Mary sighed, searching for the right thing to say. I'm your aunt, just like I always was, but I'm going to take care of you from now on, just like your Mama did. So I'm still your aunt, but I'm doing the job of a Mama. Does that mean I should call you Mama? You can keep calling me Aunt Mary, or you can call me Mama. Whatever you like better. Addie seemed to consider it for a moment. I'll keep calling you Aunt Mary for now. She turned away. I'm going to go get baby ugly hair. Mary watched her go, knowing she now needed to tell Clyde that the doll was not one her niece would love. She'd play with her obviously, but she wouldn't hold a piece of her heart as Penelope had. Mary returned to the dish drying, keeping an eye on her nephew as she did. Tomorrow is church. Charlie smiled. I'm sure there will be a lot of men at church who will have never heard of me. Why, I'll be a new lady in the midst of suave gentlemen who don't have enough women to go around. Mary laughed. Don't get too close to those cowboys at church. They don't seem to bathe very often, and your nostrils might be a tad bit offended. I grew up with seven brothers. Seven. You have no idea what my nose can tolerate with that many of them. I don't even want to think about it, Mary said with a delicate shudder. We're going to teach Joey to always stay clean. We need to make a solemn vow right this minute. She glanced over her shoulder to check on Joey again, seeing he'd crawled into a corner and had something white all over him. She sighed. Right after we clean off the flower he got into while we were talking, of course. Charlie laughed. You go clean him up, and I'll finish the dishes. Sounds like a plan. Mary walked over and scooped her nephew up into her arms, getting flour all over her apron. Mary? Charlie asked softly. Yes? Thanks for asking me to stay. It's nice to see that I can rise above my reputation with at least one of the good people of Beckham. Mary smiled. Just don't play any pranks on me, and we're all good. I won't. I wouldn't dare. You'd know it was me immediately. Yes, I would. Mary hurried off to clean up the baby, but her mind was on her friend's words. She was glad she wouldn't have to spend the rest of her life trying to live down the reputation she'd gotten as a child. Of course, Mary had been a very obedient child, so there was no reputation to live down. 